A very good day to you. I am Dr. Kai Jack Tay from the Singapore General Hospital. I'm the Director of Urologic Oncology and a consultant there, also an adjunct assistant professor at the Duke NUS Medical School. Uh, I'm very grateful today to uh, Focal Therapy Society as well as the Grand Rounds in Urology for having me here. I'm very happy to be talking to you today. My practice is primarily uh, in prostate cancer and other urologic oncology. I have a special interest in prostate focal therapy and also biopsy strategies to best select patients for focal therapy. So today, I hope to share a bit of that with you. So Willard Whitmore famously said regarding prostate cancer, for those in whom treatment is necessary, whether it would be possible. And he alluded to the fact that it, if treatment was possible, it might not be a case where treatment was necessary. But that was in the days where we did not have MRI and targeted biopsy. Today, we are diagnosing prostate cancer at an earlier stage. We are finding aggressive cancers while they are still small. Does that mean that we might perhaps be able to successfully treat these cancers before they progress and turn into something that is high stage and incurable? A case in point would be this 56-year-old man. He's sexually active, PSA of 6.8. He had an MRI. He has that lesion that is uh, marked in the red arrow and is confined to the right posterior zone. You can see a discrete lesion there on the T2 weighted on the left panel and the diffusion weighted imaging sequence of the MRI on the right panel. A targeted biopsy of this lesion showed Gleason 3 plus 3 in three cores and 3 plus 4 in one core. Uh, no other systematic cores were positive. So would this gentleman be a candidate for focal therapy? Let's have a look at the evidence. In a German study of more than 10,000 patients who were diagnosed with prostate cancer, uh, von Hardenberg looked at how many patients would be suitable actually for focal therapy either using a truly focal approach or a hemi hemiablation. And he found that less than one out of seven men would be suitable for focal therapy and one out of six men would be suitable for hemiablation. And that brings us back to the point, how could we select these patients so that we could confidently tell these one in six men or one in seven men that they are truly suitable for focal therapy without having cancer recurrence or missed cancer in other parts of the prostate afterwards. This is a summary of contemporary evidence who really needs treatment. Uh, the first two rows are active surveillance cohorts, the two longest running cohorts, which have shown that in low risk cancer at follow up of 15 to 20 years, the risk of dying from cancer or developing metastasis is extremely low. Similarly, our con uh, recent randomized trials have shown that it may be better to treat intermediate risk cancer, whereas those with low risk cancer, again, may be suitable for active surveillance. In particular, the PROTECT study showed that with active surveillance, uh, there was twice the metastatic rate of those men who had undergone radical treatment, but there was a similar cancer-specific mortality and overall survival. So really, it seems that low-risk prostate cancer, most of the time, can be safely placed on active surveillance while intermediate risk and higher cancers should be treated. And this has borne out in expert consensus. This is a summary of expert consensus on patient selection for focal therapy. Uh, what is the goal of treatment from 2010 to last year in 2019? The goal has evolved from eradication of all cancer to just eradication of clinically significant cancer. And in the latest consensus, the goal was actually to completely ablate cancer and to delay or altogether avoid radical therapy, perhaps indefinitely through treatment retreatment and surveillance. And if we look at the disease factors, treating the maximum grade, I think we are looking at treating more intermediate risk group disease. And we are talking about leaving residual disease being permissible. So residual disease of up to 3 plus 3 is being tolerated. How can we achieve success in focal therapy? These are a few tenets. We have to be able to accurately stage and grade the cancer, determine the intraprostatic position of the cancer, ablate the prostate cancer adequately with a low rate of complications, and preserve sexual and urinary function. We also have to be able to detect and salvage recurrences when they occur. So today for the topic of patient selection, I will focus more on the first three points. One question that I'm often asked about focal therapy is that how many prostate cancers are truly unifocal? Let's have a look at these histopathology studies, basically studies of radical prostatectomy specimens published since 1992 to as recently as 2015. And look at the column that's on the right-hand side, which is the percentage of cancers that are truly unifocal. And we can see that these range from something like 8.9% to about 50%, but most of them fall in the 20 to 30% range. And perhaps that ties in with the data I showed you earlier, where only one in six men may be really suitable for focal therapy. One concept 
that is changing the paradigm in focal therapy is that of the index lesion. There's some supporting data that most of the time, grade and stage is determined mainly by the index lesion within the prostate, which is defined as the lesion of the highest grade or stage in the prostate. There's some data to show that most of the tumor volume is contributed by the index lesion. Majority of satellite tumors are small and low grade, and genetic studies suggest a monoclonal origin of metastatic or lethal prostate cancer. If we apply this theory and look at again how many cancers are truly unifocal, and we exclude those satellite tumors that are clinically insignificant, 3 plus 3, or less than 0.5 ml using STAMI's criteria, we see that unifocal cancer rate actually increases. It's at 33% to 93%. So using the index lesion hypothesis, if we truly believe that, then more patients may be suitable for focal therapy. So can present imaging reliably identify these index lesions that we're talking about? So there have been several comparison studies looking at uh, comparing MPMRI to whole mount pathology. In 135 patients, Baco found that 95% of index lesions could be ident identified. Lee in 122 patients found that the chance of identifying the index lesion uh, increased with tumor diameter, Gleason score, solitary lesions compared to multifocal. And these tie in with the ability to identify index lesions. Next, are we able to target these lesions for biopsy so that we can diagnose them accurately? So using targeted biopsy to detect clinically significant disease and the index lesion, we found that the concordance rate is about 85% for Gleason 3 plus 4 on targeted biopsy. There is also data, I'm sure everyone is aware of this landmark paper in JAMA 2015 by Siddiqui, which found that MRI fusion biopsy is superior to standard trust biopsy in detecting prostate cancer. And that's probably because we are targeting suspicious areas of the prostate, which are likely to harbor index lesions much more. He found that 45% of clinically significant cancers are missed by standard trust biopsy. And and finally, the precision trial, which showed that 38% cancer detection rate by fusion biopsy versus 26% by trust biopsy, and this was for clinically significant cancer. So why a targeted biopsy? Why can't we just go on MRI alone, since MRI seems to be so good at picking up these index lesions? Well, MRI does have significant false positives. And look at this paper by Rook, uh, published in 2019. He found that 60% of false negative Pirates 5 lesions and 40% of Pirates 4 were caused by inflammation. This is a case in point from our own series. The two red arrows are showing two lesions, a smaller one in the right prostate and a much larger one on the left prostate. We took this man to prostatectomy and we found that at whole mount, uh, really that smaller lesion on the right did contain prostate cancer. We've differentially marked up the high-grade and low-grade cancer there. The black dots represent high-grade cancer and the blue dots low-grade cancer. But that much larger lesion that was designated Parrots 5 on the left, that was granulomatous inflammation. So this tells us that histological diagnosis is still very important. We're seeing lots of suspicious lesions on MRI, and we do need to do biopsies of these lesions to confirm them whether they are cancers and to grade them so that we can individualize the treatment to the patient. It doesn't matter what kind of targeted biopsy you're doing. There are multiple fusion platforms that are available now, and I believe that they all work equally well in the hands of trained operators to target these lesions for biopsy. This is an example of robotic platform for transperineal fusion biopsy that we're using at our center where we perform transperineal biopsy through two punctures and target these lesions. For patient selection for focal therapy, I've showed you that we do need to do targeted biopsies of MRI suspicious lesions. The next question is, is a systematic biopsy still really necessary? We've gone a long way, a long journey from finger guided transrectal biopsies to freehand random systematic biopsies to transrectal ultrasound. Uh, people have done template biopsies. Is it necessary to do so many. So to focus our discussion, let's have take a look at the oncological outcomes of focal therapy using mandatory rebiopsy as a surrogate. How are patients doing in contemporary studies with focal therapy? And this is a summary of 13 cohort studies with pre-focal therapy MRI and mandatory rebiopsy at 6 to 12 months. And we know that this is at best a surrogate of oncological outcome, but that's probably the best we have currently. Recurrence can occur, if you look at the cartoon, as an infield recurrence or outfield recurrence. An infield recurrence suggests incomplete ablation, whereas outfield recurrence tells us that perhaps there was missed cancer in the untreated parts of the prostate, or there could be de novo cancer that appears later. The two box plots on the left show infield cancer recurrence rates, and the two box plots on the right show outfield cancer recurrence rates aggregated from these 13 studies. Uh, on the, for the infield, you see there's a column that for infield any cancer, and the Pink column is for infield clinically significant disease, which is probably more important. You can see the infield recurrence rates are about 10% 
at a median and can be as much as 40%. If you look at the box plot all the way on the right, that's about outfield clinically significant disease. The median is about 8 to 10%, where we do see that there's a range that goes up to 15% as well. So why are we having these recurrences? I think infield recurrences can be explained by perhaps incomplete ablation, whereas outfield recurrences perhaps would mean that we did not select patients well enough. So the PROMISE study showed us that a negative predictive value of MPMRI is in the region of 76 to 89% for clinically significant prostate cancer. I think right now there is not yet a broad agreement for exactly what is clinically significant prostate cancer. If you use a definition of Gleason 4 plus 3, the negative predictive value is 89%. But if we are looking at a Gleason score of 3 plus 4 as clinically significant cancer, the negative predictive value is as low as 76%. MRI is not perfect and it's it's not 100% when it tells us that there's no cancer in the zone that we're about to leave untreated. We look back at Siddiqui's study. If he did fusion biopsies only and did not do systematic biopsies, he would have missed 5.3% of men who uh, had actually intermediate or high-risk cancer and would be thought to have no cancer or low grade. Filson et al. found that if we only did targeted biopsies, we would have missed 18% of Gleason greater than 7 cancers. And he found that combination biopsies, combining systematic systematic 12-core biopsies with targeted biopsies would be able to make up this difference. Hannah et al. similarly comparing trust biopsy and fusion biopsy found that using Euronef as a platform found that 16% of clinically significant prostate cancers were detected by systematic biopsy alone. This evidence seems to be telling us that systematic biopsy is still important. We are missing between 5 to 16% of clinically significant prostate cancer if we only do fusion biopsies. So in our center, we are doing a combination of fusion as well as saturation biopsies. I showed you earlier our platform using the BioBot surgical uh, biopsy device where we do fusion biopsies and then we follow on with saturation biopsies of the prostate. We're doing in excess of 24 core biopsies. Our data shows that both biopsies when combined, will pick up, detect 55% of the cancers. Targeted biopsy alone detected 26% of cancers, but saturation biopsy detected 19% of clinically significant prostate cancers, which means that we would have missed 19% of clinically significant prostate cancers if we had done targeted biopsy alone. We also looked into our data to find out whether there were any factors that could predict positive saturation cause outside the target area. And we found that where there was a volume discrepancy between the MRI 3D construct and the ultrasound segmentation construct, there would be a higher chance of having positive saturation cause outside the target area. We also found that the lower the period score of the index lesion, the higher the chance of having positive saturation cause outside the target area. And this suggests that if there is a discrepancy in the fusion, if there are technical errors while doing performing the fusion, perhaps it's, it would be important to perform more, more systematic biopsies. At the same time, if the period score is low in the index lesion, this could signify multifocal prostate cancer. This ties in with data by Arabi et al., who again compared systematic biopsy with MRI-targeted biopsy, finding that when the period score was high, systematic biopsy only upgraded the targeted biopsy 3.4% of the time. And this ties in with our data that when there's a highly suspicious lesion, a really highly suspicious lesion present, that is periods 5, then uh, perhaps a targeted biopsy would be all that is needed. Lastly, this was an interesting study by Zhou et al., who looked at comparing freehand uh, systematic biopsies versus template mapping biopsy. In this study, they used a robotic platform that uh, would perform a template mapping biopsy through the transrectal route. And they found that there was a significant difference in cancer detection rate for clinically significant prostate cancer using a template versus freehand. Expert consensus have addressed this topic, how best to select patients for focal therapy. I've shown you the evidence. These are what the experts think. In general, what's being recommended, as you can see, has evolved over the years from a template mapping biopsy to an introduction of MRI. And now, what the latest recommendation is for MRI and a systematic biopsy. MRI is thought to be integral. Histological sampling of suspicious lesions is definitely recommended. Histological sampling of non-suspicious areas is also recommended. The question that remains is how many cores to perform. In my center, I do a saturation biopsy of more than 24 cores. In many of the studies I showed you, they did 12 core transrectal ultrasound biopsies. The more biopsies one does, 
probably the more clinically significant prostate cancers detected, but it comes at a diminishing benefit. This was a case that I showed you at the start, the gentleman with the lesion and the right posterior gland, and we did a targeted biopsy and a saturation biopsy. Panel B, which is the upper panel, B and C, shows our targeted biopsy, and the green circle show Gleason 3 plus 3 cancer. But when we did our saturation biopsy, which is in panel E and F, we found something in the red circle, which is Gleason 3 plus 4. So in this case, saturation biopsy really helped us detect an outlying uh, intermediate grade prostate cancer. And this gentleman, instead of going for active surveillance, uh, decided to go for focal therapy. We did focal cryotherapy for this gentleman. You can see the blue arrows showing the edge of the ice ball, which has completely, uh, we have completely ablated this lesion. Uh, the green and red cartoons show the low grade and intermediate grade areas, respectively. To summarize, MRI remains the imaging modality of choice, but histological confirmation is still required, we do a targeted biopsy. Trust and template biopsies alone may be relevant for men who are not eligible for MPMRI, but those are very few and far between. Systematic biopsies may detect an additional 5 to 18% of clinically significant prostate cancer, and this is especially important in scenarios with less certainty, perhaps a low period score, which doesn't tie in with a high PSA, or in situations where you might suspect there is a fusion or segmentation error or difficulties with that aspect. Question remains, how many calls are enough? I think this has to be individualized and customized to patients and we await more data in this area. Thank you very much for your time and listening to this presentation. It was good to talk to you today. I'm Dr. Jack Tay, thank you. Mm -hmm.